So why is there church instead of nothing? You ever asked that question before? The question's not original to me, but several times over the last year I've read or listened to uh, different things, sermons, books that have raised that question, and it has therefore occupied a significant part of my thinking, and it's been particularly significant as a question with all of the challenges that the church has faced over the last year from suspended in-person worship services and reduced programming and some churches having closed and not yet and perhaps never will reopened, why is there church? And why is there church instead of nothing? Why is there church at all? Why do we need it? And what does it mean? I've selected Ephesians for our next whole book sermon series because Ephesians is very much focused on the life of the church. And it's going in that way to give us some space to reflect on these crucial questions as we kind of revive ourselves and in some ways relaunch the church in this place and a lot of its programming over the next few months. Ephesians is deeply focused on the life and ministry of the church, and it's going to let us soak in those kinds of questions and reflect on these kinds of things. Paul is concerned with how the church comes to be who the church includes, how you come into it, how you stay in it, what are God's purposes for it, and how does Christ strengthen his church and care for his church and equip his church to fulfill its mission, and what is the ultimate mission and purpose. Now the claim that the church is central to Ephesians may surprise you, Because after all, I've just read through the first 14 verses and the word church was absent. And we know that those opening verses in all of the letter, most literature throughout the history of the world introduces the most important themes at the beginning of it, doesn't it? And the Bible is no different. Most of the time we find out what matters to the biblical authors in the opening verses of the letters and the gospels and the documents that they composed. So why should we think the church is important to Ephesians if Paul doesn't even mention the word church in the opening verses? Well, I'd invite you to listen to the undertones of Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. And as I was working through this this week, I noticed how Paul refers to the community repeatedly. Sometimes you have to really listen out for the small words that we easily skip over. And again and again and again and again, he talks about us. He has blessed us in Christ, just as he chose us in Christ. He destined us through Christ. In him, we have redemption. Again and again and again, you hear this language of us, and you have to stop and kind of ask the question, when he says us, who's he speaking of? What's the answer? It's obvious, isn't it? It's the church. Paul doesn't have to say the word church to be talking about the church. The entire passage, and we'll see the whole book, assumes the presence and the reality of God's church. It describes God's action towards his church basis and the purpose of God's choosing his people for himself. And if we're going to be careful readers of scripture, we have to listen closely for these things. So in this opening chapter, we find a crucial vision really about the origin of the church. And we begin to discover God's motivation for bringing the church into existence. Why does the church exist? And for Paul, it's very simple. The church exists because it pleases God for the church to exist. The church exists because it pleases God for the church to exist. That motivation on God's part is the reason. 
And that reason, in the logic of this text, is the cause for a certain response. And that response is both implicit in the text and explicit. If the church exists for God's pleasure, it calls for a certain quality of life from those who are part of the life of the church. If the church exists for God's pleasure, for Paul, we ought to live for God's praise. And that relationship permeates this text and soaks through this text. God creates a people for his pleasure, and then that people responds to him living for his praise as grateful response. So we'll take one in turn, each in turn, God's pleasure first, and then God's praise. And I wonder... how little we really think about God's pleasures. We think about God a lot, but it's not clear to me that we often sit around and reflect on, maybe we're reading the Bible, we're thinking about, you know, this really pleases God. I think a lot of times we think about how we displease God. Maybe we feel bad because we sinned or we did something and we're not good enough for God and we can't satisfy Him and we're not, like, we struggle with those kinds of things. And, and, And that constant sense for many of our inadequacy, which is true, maybe makes it hard to think about God as one who is indeed pleased with his people. That's what comes through in this passage again and again. The church exists because it delights God to bring it into existence, to have a people for himself. And the way you see this is by paying attention to the verbs in the opening verses of Ephesians. Listen to the way Paul praises God. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So the first verb God gets is blessed. God has blessed us. And from the start, we can begin to see that there's a certain motivation, there's a certain attitude, there's a certain posture that God takes towards the objects of his blessing, namely us, you, me, his people. And that is a posture of pleasure. Like, when was the last time you said, I want to bless somebody, but I'm not happy about it? You know? Right? We assume, if I want to bless you, you're going on a mission trip, and I'm excited about that, and I'm so encouraged, and I want you to go, so I'm going to bless you and support you financially to go. And it's a joy. Like, I don't feel obligation. It's, ah, somebody, somebody, another one of those kids is asking me for money. It's not, no... It's a joy. It is my pleasure to bless you. When you do things for your kids, gifts and presents and all of these things, right? It's not because you begrudge them. It's because you love them. And it pleases you to see a smile on their face. So we begin, even though Paul isn't just saying, Hey, God blesses us because it's his pleasure. That's the implicit reality. That's the assumption. He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And that emphasizes this this overwhelming, over-the-top attitude that God takes towards his people. It's not, well, I'm going to bless you a little bit because, you know, you're my family and that's what you do. No, it's the posture we get here. The the vision of God is this over-the-top. Top, no blessing is withheld, is withheld. He holds nothing back from you. Every spiritual blessing, everything he can do, he just throws it overwhelmingly over the top. More and more and more and more is his posture. He is generous and it pleases him to be so. And what does that look like? If you want to imagine what the blessings are, then read the rest of the verse. Look at those verbs. What has he done? He has chosen us in Christ. This is not chosen like, well, we've got the kids on the playground and they're picking up teams for kickball and there's that one kid left and it's our turn and I guess we'll take them. You know, maybe you're that kid, so I'm sorry. I was. Always. That was me. 
That's not the kind of choosing we're talking about. We know it's not because we've already got this every spiritual blessing kind of language going on. This is not God saying, well, I guess I'll take you. I don't have anybody left to work with. This is God saying, I want you for my family. I want you for my purposes. I am pleased to constitute you, the people of God, as my church, my people. He chose us in Christ. We're going to talk more about the nature of that choosing in a few minutes. For now, I want you to see just this rich pleasure of God in the verbs in these verses. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. Another one, you know, so we have this, this new concept of adoption. We talk about being God's family, his children a lot. Again, the assumption is that it pleases God to do this. Occasionally, you might find someone who adopts out of obligation. Right? You can imagine a scenario where someone adopts out of obligation. You know, Maybe it's a, a family member and uh, a parent has passed away and a sibling adopts the child. And, you know, that's my, I've got to do this. This is what families do. And that's good and right. And it doesn't mean there's no pleasure involved, but you can see that sense of obligation. What I want to say is God does not adopt you as his children out of obligation. He does it because it pleases him. He does it because it is his joy. He comes to us and takes us up in his arms as beloved children upon whom he lavishes, the text tells us, every spiritual blessing. The verbs continue. I'm struck that Paul makes it explicit all the way through. He's blessed us. He's chosen us. He's adopted us. And if you didn't get it by this point with these just over-the-top verbs, he explains to us explicitly that all of this is according to his pleasure. Take a look at verse 5. Why does he destine us for adoption as his children? Paul's answer is because it pleases him to do it. It pleases God to have you as his family. It pleases God to have the church as his children. Let that sink in for a second. In fact, take a minute to remember the last time you felt like you were displeasing God. And chances are that wasn't terribly long ago. And you were probably right to feel that way. Nevertheless, God, in his kindness, is still pleased to make a family out of us text is clear and it is explicit. God lavishes, we are told, riches. Just, I, want, like, I want to read through this slowly and invite you to think about what Paul says in light of this central truth that God is pleased to have you. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Again, this isn't withholding. This is over the top, every spiritual blessing. The riches of his grace that he lavished on us. You don't lavish things on people when you're not pleased to do it. And this is the difference between over the top generosity and stingy I'll give if I'm obligated, but I don't have to. I don't want to. That's not God's posture. Extravagant pleasure is. And how pleased is he to do it? He's so pleased that when we do displease him, he doesn't give up on us. Because in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. And Paul wants the Ephesians, and he wants us to remember that God desires so greatly, He's so deeply motivated, 
He's so deeply pleased by having you and us and the global church as His family that He's willing to shed His blood in Christ to make it happen. Now those two things, they almost seem contradictory, don't they? Because obviously on the cross there's not, like Jesus is not experiencing pleasure when His flesh is being torn to pieces. And yet, we're told elsewhere in Scripture that He endured the cross for the joy set before Him. For the pleasure that is to come in naming the children of His Father, His brothers and sisters. He endures suffering because it pleases Him to call you His family. Brothers and sisters. Children of God. We read Ephesians along with Hebrews is where all that is. And we see this correlation, this rich pleasure of God to endure suffering for the sake of joy. It's crucial, friends, that we clear up misperceptions of who God is. And we allow this text to do it. So we come to the text with a variety of misperceptions. I was kind of thinking through these and making a list. We won't, I, won't, I won't mention all of them, but I'll mention a few that kind of crossed my mind. One of them is we, we misperceive God when we think of him as an angry deity waiting for us to mess up. Anybody been there? You don't have to raise your hand, but a few of us do. A few of you are like, you're like yeah, that's how I feel, right? Because... I, I, I spend my life walking on eggshells just because I know I'm a mess and I know God has his law and he's got his standard and he wants holiness and the preacher talks about holiness all the time and I, I can't measure up and I feel like I just, I'm, 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 it's, he's, just I mean, he's waiting for me to mess up and I'm going to come around the corner and he's going to be there with a lightning bolt. Stupid! How can you do that? Don't you know what I want? And that's what we think of God that way, don't we? Don't we? We live life in fear because we expect him because we think he's after us. Like, take that vision and read Ephesians and just slowly hear the words again. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. You hold those two visions of God side by side and you ask me which one is true. He's not an angry deity waiting for you to mess up so he can knock you upside the head. That is not who he is. He longs to lavish every spiritual blessing upon you. Let's clear up that misperception. Another one is the man upstairs, detached and uninterested. This one's pretty common, I think. It's not quite as ugly and vicious as the other one. It's just more like, well, you know, God's up there and he's doing his thing and maybe he's a grandfather and, uh, you know, dozes off a fair bit. The man upstairs, right? He just kind of, he's around. We know he's there, but he's not terribly involved in our lives. He's distant. Occasionally we'll go up when we need something or when we have to feed him, but otherwise, right, he's just, he's over there and we do all of this other stuff Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the rest of the week and life is busy and we have things going on and occasionally we'll pray and ask him for something and it's just the man upstairs. He's not terribly involved, he's kind of distant. So hold that beside this text. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Does that sound like an unattached, disinterested, distant God to you? Not even close. Not even close. God is not the man upstairs. He is the one who is present in Christ and the Spirit, deeply involved in the dirt of this world. He's not the man upstairs. He's the man on the cross who bleeds and 
dies for our redemption. He's not the man upstairs. He's the spirit who dwells within us. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, this is verse 13 and 14, and believed in him were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. He is not detached and uninterested. He is present and engaged. And we need to clear up these misperceptions. The church exists because it pleases God for the church to exist and no other reason. It pleases Him to reveal His purposes through the church. It pleases Him to choose for Himself a people in Christ. And this is a deeply biblical vision of who God is. I want to read to you one verse from one of the minor prophets who you may or may not have heard of. It's only three pages in my Bible, so if you're flipping through looking for something to read, chances are these pages may be stuck together and you may not even get there. But go home this afternoon and read Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God is in your midst. Not upstairs. In your midst. A warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you. With gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Take a second and just let that last sentence, that last phrase, settle in. It was stunning to me the first time I read a book a few years ago and the author brought up this verse, and he said, have you ever imagined God singing over you? Have you? We think about God in a lot of ways, right? Angry deity just waiting to smack us around, man upstairs terribly uninterested. What if God isn't that person? What if that's a figment of our imagination? What if God is more like a parent singing over his children as they fall asleep at night. I mean, that's what the Bible says. I think about, we do, we do this often with our kids. We'll sing to them as we put them to bed. And occasionally, if we miss a night, guess what they'd say? Daddy, you forgot to sing to me. Won't you sing? And Why? Because in that moment, they feel loved, don't they? They feel valued. They feel my pleasure. And maybe I'm tired. Maybe it's been a long day, and I just want to go to bed myself. And maybe there's a little work left to do. But how crucial is it to carve out that space and say, you know what? Those other things can wait. My child needs to know my pleasure and how I'm pleased with them. sing. The Bible says that's God's posture toward you. He sings over you. And what does he sing? Read the prophets. Comfort my people. Comfort. Your debt is paid. Your salvation is here. Come, you who are hungry, and eat Come, you who are thirsty, and drink. Come buy bread at no cost. Come and feast. What does he sing over you? He sings, this is my body and this is my blood. This is my covenant. This is my life for you. The psalmist writes in, the 16th Psalm, verse 11, he says of God, at thy right hands, at your, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. But this vision of God is one whose throne room is filled with pleasure. And that pleasure is a person because who is seated at God's right hand? 
who has been raised and exalted and has taken his place at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, none other than Jesus. When the psalmist says, at your right hands, at your right hand is pleasure forevermore, we are to think of Christ, in whom is all pleasure and all satisfaction and all joy. You know, we often think of God as this kind of cosmic killjoy. He just if he's not waiting for us to mess up, he's got a long list of rules. He's like, a, you know, like you, you go to college and you, your landlord, no, don't play loud music after 9.30 and right, that kind of stuff. We think like if he's not an angry deity or if he's not a detached, you know, man upstairs, he's probably like a very rule-oriented landlord. Do this and do this. If you don't do that, there's a fee. That's not the vision we get. That's actually who Satan is. In the Bible, Satan is the one who hates joy. Jesus is the one who offers it. Satan is the one who hates pleasure. Jesus is the one who offers it forevermore. And if we're going to understand, and not just understand because it's not just this cognitive thing, if we're going to embrace and really live into God's purposes for his church, then we have to understand this is not just a matter of obligation, this is not just a matter of pleasing, you know, a deity with a list of rules, this is not just a matter of ticking off the boxes or trying to not frustrate God, this is a matter of God's absolute, unadulterated, sheer pleasure form a people for his purposes and to work through them. My guess is a lot of us have never even begun to think of God like this. I didn't for a long time. But if you take the scriptures, if you take Ephesians, if you take the Old Testament, the prophets, you pull this together again and again and again, you see the pleasures of God abounding. And his people, us, we are the objects of that pleasure. Now I promised we'd talk a little bit more about this choosing that is described in verse 4. The reason we need to talk about it is because there are a lot of misperceptions about this. A lot of people read just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, and they misconstrue that to think that God is kind of before creation picking individuals for salvation and passing everyone else over and just sort of leaving them out of, <laughs> out of the party. That's not what this text says, and any reading that sort of lands there, and you may think, wow, that's crazy, who would think that? It's actually quite popular in North American Christianity, and it's taking uh, great gains amongst college students and young people. What's actually happening here? Remember, this is the church we're talking about. And God's choosing is defined in relation to Christ. God chooses Jesus. And if you belong to him, if you're a part of his body... If you're a part of his church, if you have been given union, if you're joined to him, you participate in that blessing. It's similar to the Old Testament when God chooses Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm picking you and your family. And then as we read through the Old Testament, we find there are members of Abraham's family and they're, you know, they're participating in the covenant, but they are faithless and they wind up being cut off from the covenant. That doesn't change the fact that God has chosen a people for himself. It just means that individual is not participating in that people because of their unfaithfulness. And then we find in the Old Testament people who kind of start out outside the elect community, you know, the pagans, the Gentiles, and they wind up becoming part of Abraham's family and included in the blessings of the covenant because they trust the God of Abraham. So God chooses his people, he chooses Abraham's family that has been expanded to include the nations, and we call that the church. And you come into the church through union with Jesus, 
You go from being not chosen to being chosen through union with Jesus. And God has determined since the foundation that He will rescue those who are joined to Jesus. And He calls those who are joined to Jesus to preach the gospel to those who are not so they can become joined to Jesus. (laughs) Which reflects what He said to Abraham. I'm going to choose you and your family to bless the nations. I've picked your family. There's all these other families and they're not included yet. But you are my instrument, my purposes for their blessing. I'm going to bless you with every spiritual blessing and it's going to overflow through your life and through your family to the nation so that the world can be filled with the beauty of my mercy, he says. God chooses the church. And when we come into the church in Christ, we become part of the chosen people. And the mission of the church is to make sure as many people as possible participate in union with Christ and the spiritual blessings that he provides and the gifts that he offers and the joy, the pleasure that he is, not just offers, it, he is absolute pleasure. Jesus is absolute pleasure. And the purpose, we are told, is holiness. He chose us in Christ. If you are joined to Christ, you're part of the chosen people. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Why, Paul? To be holy. To be blameless. Now we may slide into that old, those old misperceptions. Holiness, that's part of that angry deity. He wants holiness. We can't live up to that. And so he's just going to smack us around because we're not living up to his standards. But that's not what the Bible means when it talks about holiness. For the Bible, for Paul, holiness is this deep, rich participation in the pleasures of God. I mean, take that word in this passage, which is all about God just lavishing riches on you. He's not introducing some kind of wooden legalism. Hey, here's all this pleasure, but don't forget the rules. Right? It's if you've been joined to Christ and He brings you into fellowship with Himself, He brings you into a participation of deep, rich joy. And that abounds in your life and overflows in your life and exudes in your life to your family, to your neighbors, to the nations. Holiness is joy in this passage. This is your purpose. This is your calling. And don't you want to be blameless? I mean, we've talked about feeling unworthy. We've talked about feeling like we displease God. And it turns out Jesus died to make you blameless. To take away the guilt. To take away the power of the things that cause it. That's good news, friends. And it's pleasure. The church exists because God is pleased to make it exist. He doesn't turn his back. He lavishes beauty. And the response is unqualified praise. A life of praise. That's what we get here in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, when Paul starts this path, and interestingly, in Paul's Greek, 3 through 14 is one really long sentence. So if you're bored this afternoon, just go diagram it. But he just takes this sense of blessing and piles it on top of each other. There's no periods. He just keeps on going. It's over the top. Blessing, blessing, joy, lavish, pleasure, more, more, more. But at the same time, he's praising God, isn't he? He doesn't just say, hey, God blessed you, so you should praise him. That would be too easy and probably not all that compelling. But what we hear from Paul is, blessed be God, blessed be God, all praise be to God, glory be to God. All everything, he's modeling an appropriate response. He doesn't have to say it. It's obvious if God offers 
qualified pleasure and satisfaction shouldn't we offer our lives to Him in praise? And when we don't, we're saying, I'd rather not have pleasure. I'd rather have guilt. I'd rather have condemnation. I'd rather live in the mud than participate in the feast. It's implied all the way through. The church exists for God's pleasure. We ought to live for His praise. It's also explicit. (laughs) Verse 12, we've rehearsed these again and again, the pleasures of God lavished on His church. Verse 12, all that is so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of His glory. There it is, black and white. God blesses us, He lavishes us, He creates a church for His pleasure so that we can live for the praise of His glory. And that is not this sort of selfishness in God. It is the recognition that our fullness and satisfaction and wholeness is only found in acknowledging the truth of who God is. So that we who are the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. Verse 13, in him you also, he's nailing this into the Ephesians, you listen and you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. So there's this causal relationship for Paul, right? If He is pleased to bring his church into existence and lavish every spiritual blessing despite the fact that we displease, live in ways that displease him, then we ought to respond to that in lives marked by praise. And when I say praise, like I'm not just talking about singing songs on Sunday, whether it's hymns or worship song or, you know, more contemporary things. I'm not just talking about what we do, like, in the room together on Sunday. That's crucial, and it's a, it's, an, it's a marker every week that we are people defined by worship and committed to living for God, the praise of God's glory. But it should also shape everything else in our lives. Right? Do I live for the praise of His glory in the way I relate to my kids? Do I live for the praise of His glory in the way I conduct the, and lead the church? Do I live for the praise of his glory? When, we go to, when you go to work, do you live for the praise of his glory? Do you, do you live for the praise of his glory in the way that we pick what entertains us? Do we live for the praise of his glory? When we choose how we use our time. This is principle that infiltrates every aspect of our lives. There's nothing unturned. Why? Because God has lavished pure pleasure on his people. And that pleasure follows lives of praise for his glory. Praise, friends, is a participation in the pleasures of God. A life lived to the praise of his glory is a participation in the pleasures of God. And you know this from experience. You know when you're experiencing his pleasure. When you have received the gifts he's given you, when you have received the the skills and the graces and the, the wisdom and all of the things that he's given you, and you live that to its fullest. Uh, as a family, we just finished a uh, biography of Eric Little, who uh, was an Olympian and a missionary. The movie Chariots of Fire, 1981, if you're old enough to remember the 80s, check it out. Little was inhumanly fast. As we read the bi- biography, uh, I was struck by one sentence er- when he ran a race early in his career, and it remarked that he would never lose again. <laughs> like, and he never lost again. And it was stunning 
So we're watching, sometimes we'll, we'll read a biography, and then if we can find a movie about the person, we'll watch the movie after that. So we're watching Chariots of Fire last night, 1981. They've made it HD, actually, which is kind of neat. So it, like, fits your screen. It's not just the weird little box in the middle. So look it up. Amazon, it's there. But there's this scene in the movie, and if you've seen it, maybe you remember it, where Eric, is, his sister wants him to hurry up and just go be a missionary. And he's like, no, I've got to, I've got to run first. In his running, he says, he says, God made me fast. God made me fast. He said, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. When I run, I feel his pleasure. And he says, if I didn't do it, I would be withholding something from him. I would be withholding worship. I would be withholding praise. And the striking thing is that God used that. Because everywhere Little went for the rest of his life, he had an audience for the gospel. Everywhere he went, whether Scotland, China, everywhere he went. His pleasure and God's pleasure were not at odds. There was a union of purpose. So my question is, When do you feel his pleasure, God's pleasure? What do you have to be doing to say, when I do this, I feel his pleasure? Maybe it's singing. For me, it's preaching. I feel his pleasure. Maybe it's working with your hands. Maybe you're a craftsman. Maybe it's in the business world and you're doing good things. Maybe you're a musician and when you play, you feel his pleasure. Maybe you're an athlete and when you run, you feel his pleasure. What is it? What's the thing? It could be different for everyone in the room. When I do this, I feel his pleasure. He made me this way. Whatever that is, in that place, live to the praise of his glory. Live to the praise of his glory.